justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. You know, we want God to show mercy towards us. When we realize, when we come to our senses, when we have that moment of, of whatever takes place within us, where we start coming to our senses and we realize, you know what, I need some mercy. I need God's mercy in this, because if I get what I deserve, if I don't have mercy, then, then I'm in trouble here, you know. I'm not, I'm not going to do well. This isn't going to end well. This isn't going to fare well for my life. And, and so you all heard about grace is getting what you don't deserve. Amen? Everybody wants grace. You want some grace today, right? You want grace to be shown to you. You want to give grace to receive grace, right? But the thing is, is grace comes from God. Real grace only comes from God. We can't manifest it. We can't make it. We can show it, and we can re be a representation of it, but it only comes from God. And grace, God has a lot of. Everybody say, look at someone and say, God has a lot of grace. God has a lot of grace. Now look at them and say, even some for you. Even some for you. <laughs> now look at them and say, and you need a lot of it. <laughs> now there were some husband and wives y'all were taking that too serious I see I mean I've got I've got a, a view right here y'all were man if y'all could grab a hold of the scripture as intently as you were speaking it there we're we're gonna see a, a, a change in a move and so dependence we're talking about dependence we, what we have to understand is is that through life we, 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 have, uh, we need to really know what we're dependent on and what we're standing on and what the truth, the truth is, is for us to stand on. And so in Matthew 7, 3 through 5, it says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your own brother, Let me take that speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye, you hypocrite, first take out the plank of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And we, you know, in church, we're, you know, we're told, you know, uh, and around this, we kind of throw scriptures around when they're beneficial to us, and you shouldn't judge. I mean, you shouldn't be judging me, right? I mean, don't be, don't be judging me. And, and the truth is, is uh, God is justice, and He's mercy. And he is grace. But God is justice. And he's mercy. And he's grace. And so God has a just way for us to act and to behave and, and to experience his blessings and experience his promises and to experience his mercy and his grace. And really, the opposite of poverty is justice. Okay? The opposite of poverty isn't wealth. But it's justice. And when we can understand what justice is offering us, then we can really understand what grace and what mercy is all about, and we can really begin to understand the heart of God and the heart of God's plan and why He has made all these provisions for our lives. Even though the Word says our life is but a mist, a vapor, it's, a, it's short in time here on this physical earth, but yet eternity in heaven is a long time. Our eternity in hell is a long time. And so this, this uh, past week, me and my wife, you know, we traveled last weekend to, to see our son and daughter-in-law in, in Vegas, and he's stationed in the Air Force there, and uh, we just uh, like to go visit them from time to time, and uh, we, we went out to visit. Not, not really any plans, anything to, you know, do, and uh, so much as uh, just to go visit and fellowship. And so in that visit and fellowship, you know, we have... Uh, uh, that, our son Brett has a friend named Renata that uh, that he has uh, been going through some uh, uh, a marital situation. He's got two kids, two and a half years old. They're twins, two beautiful young lady little girls. Uh, I mean, they're just really beautiful. And uh, but but he's got some uncertainty going on right now inside. And so our, through that uncertainty, you know, we went and visited Saturday night, and through that conversation, you know, uh, we. Uh, we, my wife, I said, she said, we're going to church in the morning. You want to go to church with us? 
And uh, I'll just tell you, he's been in Vegas a couple years, and he hasn't been to church. He's, he's been a part of a church uh, when he moved, but he hadn't been for some time. And uh, he said, yeah, I'll go. I'll go. And so we were excited about it, and we got prepared the next morning and got up, and, you know, we were really, uh, you know, intently excited because uh, we just felt like something was going to happen. And you know, although we didn't talk about it, I, we just felt like something was going to happen. And so, you know, when we went, uh, actually we started calling him and what happened is he didn't answer the phone. <laughs> That's what happened is he didn't answer the phone. Something did happen. He didn't answer the phone, but we got ready a little early, so we were able to go by his apartment early. And when we got there, uh, he was there and uh, he had been waiting on his kids. Uh, his wife had dropped the kids off. They're separated right now. And, uh, and so we got them ready and we went to church and the message was phenomenal. The guy brought the word. He, he presented the truth. And the whole time, I just kept thinking, this is why we made this trip. This is why we're here. This is why we're here. And through that message, and through that time, and through, I know, four of us that were sitting there on the same row as him were praying for him to receive God's justice, God's mercy, and God's grace. We wasn't just praying for him to receive God's grace. Okay? And see, internally, we have to understand that internally, we only know a little bit of what God's plan is, but we know God has a plan, and God has a plan for your life today. God wants to move upon you and through you in such a way that other lives are affected by your life. Okay? And, and so in that time, uh, the, ser the service got ready to the, to the end and the, there was a time of prayer and a time of inviting people. And I mean, uh, I, knew, I knew people were going to come. I mean, I just could feel that God was using that message and people were going to come. And sure enough, when the altar call happened, there were eight ladies that came forward. Okay? All these ladies. And I thought, and this was, you have to realize there's about 500 people there. And I thought, and in the message, the pastor has said pride. He had mentioned pride several times. And I thought, man, I know for a fact because I kind of peeked out of the corner of my eye when the pastor did the whole bow your hand, raise your hand thing. I know for a fact that his hand went up. I'm just telling you, I had to look. He didn't say no one peeking. No one looking around. So I just took the liberty, and I saw the hand go up, and I just said, man, God. I know this is his time. This is his time, Lord. This is his time. And he even leaned over to bread. He said, my bread, he made me. He said, I raised my hand. I feel like I can go up there. And about that time, when the pastor walked down off of those ladies, he said, I know there's some men here. I know there's some men here. Okay. And so it's through that I lost my mic here. Hold on a second. Be worried about it, but... Someone back there may not be able to hear. <laughs> now, you, now you can hear? All right. But it's through that that when he made the comment, he said, I know there's some men here, that immediately he stood up and went to the front. Okay? Immediately. Now, I'm going to tell you, there was other guys that got up because he got up. Now, in... In understanding God's dependence, in Hebrews 4, 16, it says, Let us therefore come boldly. Amy, will you go back there and adjust this down? Or Tom, Tom's got it down a little bit. Because I might decide to holler, and then it might really get loud. So, uh, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain, everybody say obtain, Amen. mercy and find grace to help in times of need. And so the scripture tells us, let us therefore come boldly. Everybody say boldly. 
So if I'm coming boldly to the throne of grace, if I'm coming boldly to the throne of grace, I don't know anybody that initially comes boldly to the throne of grace unless they know what they're doing. Okay? Because if we don't know what we're doing, we're going to be intimidated. If we're intimidated, we're not going to come boldly. And God didn't give us a spirit of fear or intimidation. God gave us a spirit of power and of sound mind. He gave us the right thinking before we even get to the process, really. God is trying to give us the right thinking before we even get to the process. You see, there is a heavenly inheritance that has to be received that deals with justice, that deals with mercy, that deals with grace. There's a heavenly inheritance that God wants to bestow in and through our lives that's going to make a difference not just in the immediate, but also in the future. Okay? And God wants to deal with the immediate. There's someone right in here right now. I know that God wants to deal with what is immediately going on in and through your life. Okay? And He's going to do that. He's going to deal with that. But the understanding of that you can boldly come to the throne of grace and may obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need is going to be important. You see, church, there is a God that is at work on your behalf. There, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God, which is dealing with God's authority, which is dealing with abounding and abasing, with broadening and advancing the kingdom of God in you right now. And God's got to advance the kingdom of God within you so it can be advanced in the world today. Amen? God wants to use you, and God wants to impart that in your life. And so we see in 1 Peter 1, 3, it says this. Oh, let me read this. We have to understand begin, uh, dependence begins with a declaration of dependence. When I understand that I need God in my life more than anything, the one thing that he said before we went to church and uh, uh, the one thing that he said after is he got a question answered, and the question was this, I just need to know that everything's going to be okay. Okay? I can't answer that for no one. You can't answer that for anyone, but you can know this, God can. God can make it. God can reside. God can take place and position within right now in any circumstance, in anybody's life, if they really want to know if everything's going to be okay, God can answer that question for them. And God is willing and ready to answer it and use you. In 1 Peter 1, 1.3 it said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. Everybody say a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so God has, he, he, it says, which according to his abundant mercy, everybody say abundant mercy. <laughs> now let me ask you, do you want justice for your life or do you want mercy for your life? Why wouldn't you want justice? Justice. <laughs> Someone said, because we're going to get punished. Let me tell you, when you step off in and you've had that question answered that everything's going to be all right and you're made right with Jesus Christ and His righteous, you're not afraid of justice no more. Matter of fact, the enemy will try to lie to you and he's going to try to steal all the justice that God has for your life. He's going to try to steal it away because he doesn't want you to operate in justice because when you're operating in justice, and the opposite of poverty is justice. When you're operating in God's justice, let me tell you, the abundance of God's mercy can manifest in and through your life. And so what happens is the enemy has created a veil. He's created this, and he tells us, oh, he's, he's okay with you getting saved to a point. The enemy's even okay with it. Just don't let him grow up and understand the kingdom of God. Let's keep, let's keep in the church talking about getting people saved. Let's talk about getting them in the kingdom. He, he's, he's almost okay with that. Because what happens when you understand justice, mercy, and grace, and how it's working in and through your lives, then not only is your life being affected and impacted, other people's lives are being affected and impacted. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. He's got to get us again to a living hope. But yet, if I don't feel saved today, or if I feel condemned today, He didn't, he didn't come to condemn you. It says that He came to fulfill the law, but He came to give you hope and a future. And the Spirit will convict and show you and try to mature you. He's giving you a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Titus 3, 5 says this, Not by works of righteousness. I heard that amen. Thank you. <laughs> Not by works of righteousness. Amen. Which we have done. But according to His mercy. Everybody say His mercy. He saved us through the washing of the regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. So heavenly discipline is something we need. We need heavenly dif discipline over eternal regret or over regret. It's interesting, I, I threw this scripture, it's not going to be in your outline, Sec Second Chronicles uh, is Solomon, and he, we believe, is the wisest man to ever live. He asked for uh, wisdom from the Lord, and God gave it to him, but yet he made a lot of bad decisions. <laughs> and so, but, but in Second Chronicles 7, 11 through 14, and we use this a lot, it says, uh, we, we, we usually start at verse 14. I'll, I'll kind of jump back in a minute, but at verse 14 in chapter 7, it says, If my people who will call are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. I mean, y'all have heard that before, right? Okay. Well, when Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and, and had su succeeded in carrying out all he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his own palace, the Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayers and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. And he says, verse 13, When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague upon my people. He says, I'm trying to get someone's attention today. I'm trying to shake things up a little bit so that you can see that there is a God that is in control and there is a God that is in love with His people. There is a God that has made every provision and that provision is placed in us through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the saving grace of Jesus Christ, but more importantly and more uh, inducing, I guess, into our lives is the justice that God is trying to bring. There is a just way for, for me to live, but it requires heavenly discipline. And if I operate in heavenly discipline, I don't have to regret my life. A heavenly discipline. In John 16, 33, it says this, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace, in you, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. I don't know if it ever felt like good cheer before I knew I had the saving grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I don't think it ever felt like good cheer when I was going through trials and tribulation. But I'm here to proclaim, and I'm here to testify, and I'm here to tell you that there is a grace, there is a mercy, and there is a joy that can come in into your life in every storm that life tries to bring. It's through... Jesus, he is trying to bring that. He's trying to place it in, and he's willing to use anything to get our attention. What's it going to take for God to get your attention today? You know, when we, when we left there, I, I was thinking about Renato, and I was thinking about his two young girls, and I thought about, you know, you know what? And he said, I just wanted to know if everything's all right. And all I could think about, well, now it is. Now everything's going to be all right. Everything has the possibility of being all right, church. Think about that one person that you know right now that is asking the question, I just need to know if everything's going to be all right. How many people do you know that want an answer 
to that question. I just need to know, is everything going to be all right? I've lost my job. We don't have financial resources. We don't know if we're going to be able to pay the bills. We don't know where our daughter is. We don't know where our kid is. We don't know. I don't know where my husband is. I don't know what he's doing. Is everything going to be all right? I know someone that can answer that question. I know he can answer the question. He's ready to answer the question. He's ready to answer the question for every one of us. It's all going to be all right. If you step across the line and ask. But we have to ask the question. And we have to boldly come to the throne so that we can obtain mercy and that we can find grace and that we can find the help in the time of our need. There are too many things that are distracting people. There are too many things that are making promises to people that are trying to answer these questions, but they're not going to be answered or it's not going to be fulfilled because they're not going to the throne of grace to ask the question. In Ephesians 2, 4, it says, But God, everybody say, but God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us. He's rich in mercy. Everybody say, rich. rich. You see, the opposite of poverty is not rich. It's not material wealth. It has nothing to do with it. As a matter of fact, we've talked in here before that, that money is the lowest form of blessing that we can receive. It's needed. But why do we settle for the lowest form when God is trying to get us to the highest form? Discipline is important. If we understand heavenly discipline, we will begin to operate in the economy of of the heavens, not the economy of the world. And I'm telling you, the economy of the heaven, it supersedes and takes over and reigns. And yes, it can take care of bills. And yes, it can take care of issues. It can take care of feeding the birds of the air. It can take care of your own bellies. But it's when your own bellies wants more that it becomes a distraction. I'm starting to preach to me now. <laughs> Heavenly discipline over regret. Discipline is choosing between what you want now and what you want most. So if I, I choose pain of discipline or I can choose pain of regret. Pain of obeying my parents now over the pain of consequences later. My mom's here. She's saying, yes, yes, he did. <laughs> She's shaking her head big time. She knows. Pain of studying now or pain of retaking the class later? Pain of saying no to temptation now or the pain of trying to beat addiction later? Pain of living within your means or the pain, pain of pain climbing debt later? Misery is optional. Pain is inevitable. It's going to happen. Misery is optional. Too many people are living a miserable state of being, and that is not the promise that God had in Jesus. I hope someone gets this today. I hope I'm taking someone to a place today to where you understand that when the justice and when the mercy and when the grace is there, there is always enough in the kingdom of God. There's always enough for you to see and know that God has provisions for you to have a way out. Discipline is choosing between what you want now and what you want most. And let me hear, here's the challenging thing in this. And Paul says this in Romans seven fifteen. He says, I don't really understand myself. I don't really understand myself is what Paul says. He says, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Paul's saying this. But he says, I want to do what is right, but I can't. Verse 19, I want to do what is good, but I don't. 
I don't want to do what is wrong, but I, but I do it anyway. Verse 24, oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? And then he says, verse 25, thank God. Everybody say, thank God. Thank God. The answer is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank God. And what he goes on to teach is he tells us in uh, Romans chapter 8 is there is life in the Spirit of God. There is life that where the Spirit wants to lead us, who is training us, who is disciplining us, who is showing us what the heaven, the kingdom of heaven is really supposed to look like. God wants us to operate in the kingdom. He says, my will be done in earth, on earth as it is in heaven. He wants us to operate in the economy of the kingdom of God. But yet we don't understand the kingdom of God, therefore we don't operate in it. And we, we can't boldly come to the throne of grace, that heavenly place, to where we know how to operate in it, because most of the time we don't know what we're talking about. It reminded me of what the pastor said when he first got up there to preach. He said there was a, a conference, it was at the United Nations, and they had this big sign in front of the conference that said, Welcome. All over it said, Welcome, in all the different languages. And he said there was one letter off in one of the welcomes, and instead of welcome, it said circumcision. <laughs> it changes everything. The one letter changed everything. Can you imagine if you came to church this mo morning and we said circumcision Sunday? Doesn't sound very nice. However, one letter. But what we know is we know that the Spirit of God actually is here to circumcise us from the inside out. Remove the excess out of our heart to take away the fat, the thing that we don't need, the thing that is trying to give you the most desire in your heart, the thing that your heart is longing for, the Holy Spirit wants to reveal. He wants to show you your intents and thoughts behind your motives in that. Is it something that can further the kingdom of God or is it something that can build me a castle or a kingdom? Because if you're building you a castle or a kingdom and it's not further than the kingdom of God, it's of no importance to God. And if it's of no importance to God, then our heart will become divided and we're not going to be able to come to the throne room of God and ask in our need in such a way that God's going to answer. And I'm here to tell you, church, God is ready for us to become the church and become effective in being the church. Amen? And I'm going to tell you right now, it starts within you. It starts with you. Right now, it starts with you. Thank God the answer is Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so choosing discipline over regret. Discipline is choosing between what you want now and what you want the most. What is it right now that God wants to do in your life? We've got to choose, begin to choose discipline over regret. Every one of us in here know we could study the Word more. Every one of us in here know we could pray more. Every one of us in here knows that we could try to test a fast in our life and see where that takes us in the things of God. Every one of us know how to be more dependent or more dependable within ourselves. Every one of us know that we lie to ourselves. We say we're going to do something and we can't even keep our word to ourselves. If you don't keep your word to yourself, you will never keep it to anyone else. Miss Pat? <laughs> you got to keep your word to yourself. All right? Every one of us know. Choosing discipline over regret, we see in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 25, it says this, Don't you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for eternal prize. So there is something going on in the realm of our spiritual life that what God is wanting us to obtain to. There is something that God is disciplining you in. He's, he's wanting you to choose discipline to where we begin to mature and we begin to understand. In Psalms 145, 8 through 9, it says this, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Everybody loves that the Lord is full of compassion, right? You love that the Lord is gracious 
He's slow to anger. He's great in mercy. The Lord is good to all, is He not? And His tender mercies are all over all His works. And let me tell you, when, when Jesus died on the cross and He said, before He died, He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He meant it. He meant that. He meant that we could not get what was going on. But it's through His Spirit that we can be led, that we can begin to understand, that we can begin to mature, that our, our life can begin to be an example for other people's lives. This morning before I, before I came in here, I was again just going back over my notes and for whatever reason I went to Matthew 18 and it wasn't a scripture I had, but it just came to mind. Uh, Matthew 18, 11, it says, For the Son of Man comes to save that which was lost. And I thought, man, I love that, that He came to save that which was lost. And, and that's so challenging to me. And, and God just reminded me, He said, Dan, that's why you're here too. You're here to save what's lost. And I was like, man, God, I like that. And he said, yeah, Dan. He said, but you're here to teach them to do that too. And I said, God, but how can I do that? He said, don't worry about that part. I've got that taken care of. You see, what I know is that this is we have a hard time with the economy of God. We have a hard time understanding God's way. But as I continue in verse 12, it says, how thank ye... And I was thinking, how do I think? You know, right? I mean, I think I understand sometimes, but I don't. And then it says, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety-nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which is gone astray? And God, and immediately when I was sitting in there, the guy was like, well, that's, that's why you went to Vegas. You thought you went to see your son. But he said, there was one that had gone astray. I can't even figure that out. I can't even figure out why God would send us, and all the people there, God sent us. To be there in that moment, when He raised His hands for me to look out of the corner of my eye and see His hand go up. And think, yes, God. And then all of a sudden they do the altar call on him. He's not getting up, Lord. And immediately God spoke in my heart, pride, pride. We all have pride. Even you do. And immediately I thought, man, just get up. Because on the other side of this, I know the good. I know the love. I know the peace. I know the joy. I don't care what storms. I know that God is reigning and in charge of it all. And it is going to be okay. And that's what God is bringing, and that's what God has brought, and that's what we know, but we have to step more than across the line. We have to get busy. We have to get away from that line. We have to get busy doing God's will and going after the one. And let me tell you, that in the economy realm of this, this isn't very smart because when the shepherd leaves the 99 He's risking all of it for the one. Is a business practice? This is not smart. But we're not talking about a business practice. We're talking about the economy. We're talking about the kingdom of God. We're talking about what is a soul really worth to God. He has sent His own Son, Jesus, to die on the cross so that we could have life in our hearts, so that we could be in the midst of anything. Well, that word boldly means, actually, if you go study that word boldly, it says to be in the midst. If you were to be in the midst of the Most High God, let me tell you, you could go through anything. Let me tell you, church, everybody should be standing on that one, not just Pat. <laughs> I know, I know, it's uncomfortable. Choosing discipline over regret does what? It changes your life. 
It sets a new destination. It changes everything. It means you're willing to risk it all for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And it is His compassion. It is, yes, He is slow to anger. And yes, He is great in mercy. And the Lord is good to all. And His tender mercies are over all His works. But once you become His, let me tell you, the only way for you to completely mature in the kingdom of God is for you to go through some of the trials and some of the temptations and some of the tribulations to get God's peace. Amen? Amen. What do you need to choose now to accomplish what God wants most is the last question I have for you. What do you need to choose now to accomplish what God wants most? In 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 27 says, so, so I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing, I am disciplined. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. What should you do? What's God inviting you to do? Okay? What are you going to accomplish? What do you need to choose to do now to accomplish what God wants most? See, the Bible says that God is rich in mercy. We read that scripture. He saves us because of anything, or saves us not because of anything we have done, but because of His mercy alone. Church, do you understand what God needs you to do? He needs you to give Him your whole heart. To surrender your life unto His plan, unto His provisions, and to begin to trust. The worship team is going to come up this morning. And as they get ready to come up and we have this time at the altar, I'm going to ask you to take a position, to take a position beyond the line. Many of y'all have made decisions for Jesus Christ a long time ago. You've been growing, you've been maturing, you've been stepping up, you've been stepping out. But let, I'm going to ask you to do something else. I'm going, to step you, I'm going to ask you to take a step further. I'm going to ask you to let the Lord speak to your heart and show you how to make the right choice to do and to make a decision now to accomplish what God wants most, not what you want most this week.